How's everyone doing? Good. Good? How about before we go any further, I've been back there. They've been hanging back there the whole stage. It's hot back there. Give these TEDx an incredible a round of applause. Yeah. I've been really amazed and impressed with everything they've done. I've really enjoyed meeting all of you. I, I hope we build some relationships in the future. Uh, for those of you who attended my workshops, I hope you enjoyed those as well. I'm going to be talking about the Digital Eye Project and really more of the conceptual basis of it. This is work born here at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And the, really the goal is to create accurate 3D models of life on Earth, the life that shapes us every day. And, you, and it shapes us in many ways that we can't even begin to imagine. And I hope I can inspire you to believe you, or really inspire you to see some of the beauty of some of these animals around them in just a new way. Now, uh, for those of you over about 30, this movie was very influential for us. It was very important and inspired lots of kung fu kicks <laughs> among kids. The Matrix, which came out in 1999, was a social, was really a special effects standout. And that's because it had everything doing Keanu Reeves, doing baking bullets, to full 360 kicks. And the special effects behind the scene were indeed really amazing. Uh, for example, here's some of these 360 kicks by Trinity and the amazing sort of subway fighting scene between, between Keanu Reeves and Agent Smith, I believe it was. And then the background was actually behind the scenes. They had, in fact, hundreds of cameras doing amazing stop motion photography. Re reimagining the human form in all kinds of ways that was very inspiring to many people. And this was a, a great moment, really, in, I believe, in motion history, but also inspired a lot of people interested in the way we perceive the world in general, uh, especially those interested in motion and movement and form. And in fact, these technologies and the way that they really looked at, actually, motion and everything else was really been spreading. Uh, any of you want to be in a zombie movie? All right. I do. No problem. You can be in a zombie movie. Just go to one of the studio in LA, use a lot of the same set of these the Matrix, hundreds of cameras. You get yourself photo scanned to a digital avatar, and you'll be, your avatar will be sold online, and then you will be used in a zombie movie or some other purpose that you have no control over because you signed over your rights to your avatar. <laughs> other examples of this, which are fun, for those of the kids, Guardians of the Galaxy, Rocket Raccoon was fun. He was scanned from a raccoon with the same technology, again, multiple cameras, creating this animated model that was based off a real raccoon. Or if you want to play a video game, nowadays the way video games are made is they actually photograph the set using a drone, and then you can play that same set in video game technology. But these are amazing innovations, obviously. But there, as you can see, all those examples I gave you were really commercial innovations. They were available, and the, 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 the methods were largely proprietary, not really available to sort of everyday use, everyday citizens. The work that I've been doing the last few years with the Digital Life Project has really been just asking the question is, how do these methods can really be used to benefit all of us? And how can they be used to really further the kind of the causes of science, education, conservation, things that we all really care about? And this actually really falls squarely within the context of digital heritage, which is a much bigger concept that cuts across many aspects of science and conservation and art and history. Uh, for example, uh, we have here on the upper left a, an amazing 3D laser scan by the organization SciArc of downtown Philadelphia. One day, uh, who knows when, downtown Philadelphia won't be there, I suppose. And we have, we'll have a nice laser scan to remember the history and the amazing architecture that was there or perhaps an amazing 3D sculpture by this artist there uh, that's posted online that you can, uh, you can obtain. Uh, but, and also, some of you may be missing this gentleman right here, last few years, but don't worry. Autodesk took the time and the effort to scan him in seven amazing photos, and you can download his 3D scan anytime you want. Digital heritage is really the concept that things that are thermal, like these buildings, or human beings, they pass. But we can we put them into a format that is there, permanent, for all of us to enjoy and share in a new digital format. As we just heard, the, the, obviously the digital age has its own set of troubles, but also has new opportunities for us to take advantage of. But one thing that when I uh, kind of came on the scene several years ago, and I'm a biologist by training. I work with many different animals. Uh, I work with many animals for many years. But the main point that became so clear to me was that one big area that was missing was 
really digital heritage of life. And when I say life, I don't just mean purely like a museum specimen, which I, I strongly support. I also mean like all those really undefinable aspects of life, the way an animal sits, the color, the, the other aspects of life that when you find an animal, the joy and the discovery and the beauty of them, the subtle details come to life. And it's not surprising that these amazing technologies I mentioned to you, which are just now beginning to understand, haven't really been applied so much to life. Because look at all the complexity, penguins, frogs, flowers, and we're not even mentioning the bacteria or viruses. And also, some of these animals are only found in the wild. You can't find them, perhaps, only in a, a zoo-like setting. So the same way, though, in, in that buildings or structures are thermal, then also these animals are thermal as well. And the reality is that many animals we work with, that, and it's become abundantly clear the last few years, such as sea turtles or frogs or rhinos, are very vulnerable to extinction. Some of them have gone extinct. And this is really the same issue as all the major amazing artifacts. The, re the reason why people go to so much trouble to scan them or to study them is for that same reason. This frog down below is a pretty cool frog. It's called the Rob's tree frog. A few years ago, there was one individual left of that species in the Atlantic Botanical Garden. When the animal died, that species went extinct. I never got a chance to scan that frog. I would have loved that. It would have helped us understand the history. So we understand that this animal existed, so we don't forget. It's not to say that it will replicate all aspects of that animal, but it helps us gain that sense of history. Uh, and also it allows it to use us for science, many other uses. So with this as a backdrop, our organization really um, set out to have the goal of creating accurate 3D models of life on Earth for really three main purposes, conservation, science, and education, and democratize the methods and the models that we get, and so see if there's a way we can use them. But it raised a lot of really thorny technological questions. The biggest one was being, well, how would you create 3D models of live animals in the first place? If you're going to recreate the animal as it exists, with the posture and the colors and the shape, how do you do that? And how do you do it in the wild? Uh, and that's a very important point, because the reality is a lot of animals exist just in the wild. We don't have replicates of those animals in uh, in captive situations. This is a method that we ultimately settled on that is the, really our bread and butter for reconstructing animals in 3D. And those 3D models that we create, and I'll show you some examples of them, can be used in many different ways. They can be used for use in a virtual reality or augmented reality setting. They can be 3D printed and used in education. They can be used for a game or a movie. And we're finding that the usage of them is multifaceted in many different ways. But what we have here is a frog. This is actually the golden poison frog. It's the most toxic frog in the world, and he's got little tadpoles on his back. This is a good dad. As one of my friends, uh, this is a very toxic frog. One of my friends called a badass dad on the go. Uh, he's got tadpoles. We photographed him at the zoo Atlanta with a multi-camera system. We got multiple photographs of him. We were then able to convert those to a 3D mesh, much like clothing. And then you overlay the photos on top of the frog, and you create these very realistic 3D avatars that you can rig and have move, just like you see in the movies. This is exciting new innovation in 3D scanning. And this is a good example. This is a loggerhead sea turtle that was captured at a power plant in Florida. It was trapped. We work with inwater.org to, uh, and when they processed the animal, they allowed us to photograph it with 20 different camera systems. Uh, my good friend photographer, uh, Christine Shepard, led that work. And we were able to recapture everything we wanted about the animal, the color, the shape, the texture, the barnacles, all the details that make this individual, an individual. And then we actually animate the motion to make it a realistic motion. The animator, Johnson Martin, did a really amazing job to bring this animal to life. But with that as a possible goal, then let me take a step back and actually say, how do we actually get started? And the way I actually got started was actually working with animals that are really the hardest to work with at all, and those are sharks. I've worked with sharks for many years. Sharks are a great example of why this technology is important. Once you capture a shark on a boat, and you work on it, and you get data, and you let it go, that shark's never coming back. Um, I once had a, a person who was collecting data for me, and they were supposed to write down the data, and that shark off the boat. I'm like, where's my data? Oh, I didn't write down some of my data. We're never getting that shark back. So it's imperative that when you get these animals, you're able to recapture everything about them as much as you can. So together with uh, Dr. Neil Hammerschlag from University of Miami, we actually got lucky. We just collaborated with the Discovery Channel, and we worked with a shark. And one of the first things that was all said to me was, this is never going to work. You're never going to take all these photographs of a shark. The shark is going to thrash around in the boat. 
But I knew enough about these animals to know that you have to treat animals respectfully. You have a protocol and a method with them. In this case, we capture a black-tipped shark. We have a pump in its mouth so the animal can breathe. The animal is fine. We were able to release the animal about 30 seconds later. And while they worked up the shark, I was able to capture enough photos of the animal. And the animal posed beautifully to create a 3D rendering of this shark. And that's what you have here initially is a 3D base mesh that you create from the system. And then you're able to recreate the color texture on top of it. So that is this shark that anyone can use and download. And I'll explain shortly how many people have actually done that. So if you want to download this shark and use it, you're welcome to. We were kind of inspired enough by this initial effort, we thought everything would go badly, <laughs> as things tend to go in science, that we actually set out to do much more elaborate ways to actually capture animals in the wild. We started creating 3D systems, uh, multiple camera rigs that could take in the field and make them portable. We call this the beast cam technology, uh, for obviously the beast cam. And with this work, uh, we can give you an example of it. We have here a 42 camera system which was funded in part by NSF to visualize lizards. But here I'm showing it with a frog. This is a big frog. This is Al Richmond's frog in the biology department. It's about a frog that wide and that tall. And it turns out when you surround a large frog with cameras, they freeze. I have no idea why. <laughs> so you can see the expression on his face basically. I don't know what to do, but if I just don't move, everything's going to be just fine. <laughs> with this system, we're able to rapidly capture 3D models of all these amazing animals, uh, many of which I'll show you in a minute. But it was, a, it was important for us to have a system that has high throughput, that worked efficiently, that was basically very easy to use with the animals. And we started creating gear for new challenges. Uh, this is a system that's originally designed for architecture by engineer Michael Prayer, but we actually developed a system for photo capture 3D uh, sea turtles in 3D. This is at the Loggerhead Marine, Light, Marine Center in Florida. This is, a, this is a loggerhead sea turtle. And this system can be put in a case, can be taken anywhere. We go all around the world, we work with all kinds of different animals. But in addition to actually recreating the animal's shape, we're also very interested in recreating actual motion in the animal. The reality is that when animators create motion, we see motions in movies or videos, it's just a, it's essentially a replica where they use very elaborate technologies. But machine learning is becoming a very powerful tool that's enabled us to break new boundaries and the Center for Data Science was very generous in funding a graduate student, John Zhu, here from the University of Massachusetts, to work with myself and George Lauder and Professor Vangelis Kaliarkis to create a machine learning algorithm. Sounds very complicated, but what it really is is basically software. What that software does, it takes a 3D model, like our shark, it creates a rig, which normally an animator would do, and that animator would spend hours doing it and would do it by eyeball, and they would do it different every single time. But it does it consistently. And then we take video from an actual shark swimming, feed it into the machine learning algorithm, and we create a swimming shark that swims the way sharks are supposed to swim. This is a good example of that work. This is a sample video we have of this process, so there's a 3D model of a shark down below. That's an actual cat shark above. We took the motion from the top one and put it in the bottom one. You think of, most people think of sharks as aggressively moving. They're slow moving, they're calm. It's important to depict these animals the way they really move. We took that same rig, we put it in another fish. This is automatic. Again, normally an animator would have to spend hours doing this. So this is an exciting potential for a high throughput system. It allows us to not just recreate the shapes of animals, but also their motions and the way they move and the way we perceive them and believe them. That's a big step, we believe, towards recreating life. So where are we going with this in the future? Um, I don't know about you, but I, I really enjoyed high school dissecting frogs. I know it makes me a little disturbing for <laughs> many of you. But for many people, it is actually a big problem because you know, they may not have access to materials. Uh, they may not really relate to this material that's presented to them in a very standard fashion. With virtual reality and augmented reality around the corner, and there's big investments and changes on that, I think I would really excited about creating what I call the biology lab of the future. The biology lab of the future is a multifaceted virtual reality or augmented reality experience in which you can really experience the beauty of life and all the scientific basis and fundamentals of life in a really integrative way. For example, you'd, you could choose different models, you could visualize them, you could integrate them with things like CT scans or MRI data, or you could Tour around the Earth, go to different habitats, explore Earth, get your passions fired up about animals and life. And really learn not just about the animal, but also the science, and learn about the data behind it. This would be good for scientists and for educators. So 
A virtual frog, yes, I think that would be fantastic. Not to really replace dissecting frogs, but to complement them. Uh, this is a frog that we scanned, it's a horned frog. My collaborator at the University of Florida Museum of Natural History has done amazing things doing CT scans and MRIs of frogs. As you can some of you see there, and we, I would really love to combine our exterior beautiful scans with his amazing work uh, to create a sort of virtual experience and really bring the beauty of life and the diversity of life to students in a new way. So where we're going with this in the end is most great content that you see, high quality anime content, movies, films, they cost money. And it's a commercial model. Ours is not a commercial model, commercial model. we prefer university. We have actually worked with partners, zoos, uh, aquariums, scientists. They provide funding for the work that we do. And one of the terms of the licensing agreements is that we can provide the models back to others for free for nonprofit use. And that has proven very successful. We've only collected 52 models of animals, of only which seven or eight are good. We've had about 16,000 downloads. We get, imagine how much life there is on Earth, the demand, the desire for this. Is it through the roof? There are 4,000 species of lizards alone. We have scanned five of them. So I think if you believe that people will pay attention, the numbers tell the story. They tell the story in a big, big way. And we're continuing to move forward. We've actually established all kinds of partnerships now. We'll be releasing lots of models in the future. I hope that you follow us as we move forward. We have a website. You can download our models. You can use them in virtual reality experiences. You can 3D print them. You can study them. You can just geek out on shark morphology or snake morphology or lizard or frog or flower. And, or if you're arachnophobic, you can overcome your phobias to large, giant spiders. <laughs> but I, in conclusion, I really want to say that where I hope to see this go is not just purely a collection, but something I hope that inspires us. The reality is our relationship with animals, especially top predators, crocodiles and sharks and rhinos, and is a pretty mixed one. One where we've had a pretty antagonistic relationship. But that has changed somewhat. And a lot of big parts of changes. Wildlife photography played a big, big role in convincing us and changing our perception of these animals. We learned to love them. You can learn to love things. And just as that has a case, I think these new 21st century technologies can play a role. This is a sea turtle that, we've, that was found by the Largo Marine Life Center floating half dead in the surf in Florida. It had been bitten by a tiger shark, most likely. Tiger sharks hunt turtles. It's what they do. There's an ancient relationship between the two of them that's lasted for millions of years. Now, you thought you had a bad day, right? The sharks, this turtle survived. They're tough. Turtles are tough. And you can see the bite mark on the, on the shell. You can see the flipper and amputated. This turtle was actually released about a month ago. But we were able to create a 3 d model turtle, and you can explore it. You can learn about these animals, learn about the relationship it has with these sharks. The struggle for existence that Charles Darwin talked about something that defines animals from the moment they're born to the moment they die, something that we can really gain a newfound appreciation for when you see these kinds of models. So I just do want to acknowledge uh, the many people who have collaborated with me on this work. I could not have the, done this work without them, artists, uh, scientists, engineers. We actually have undergraduates who are co-inventors on the patents that we've created with some of this technology. Um, and want to acknowledge funding along the way that's allowed us to get this work done. So. Thank you very much.